The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, hi everyone. Nice to be in uh, Greece virtually this year. Um, my name is Ohad Hershkovitz. Uh, I'm a psychologist in Israel. Uh, we're talking with you today about the uh, CBT time protocol, which is a trans diagnostic protocol. Um, I'm going to be going and uh, moving quickly. Uh, originally, when I created the presentation, I thought I would uh, have more time, and then I realized we only have an hour and a half, so I'm going to try to give you as much information as I can within an hour and a half, and also leave time to practice a little bit. Um, so if I'm going too fast, please let me know in the chat, uh, and obviously you also have the recording so that you can go back later and watch. Um, for those of you uh, listening live, uh, if you're able to access the chat, can you just let me know how many of you actually have experience with a transdiagnostic protocol? Uh, if you've used one, if you've learned one, uh, if you could just let me know in the chat, just like to get an impression of um, how much experience you have. And uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm going to give in the meantime an explanation uh, or a definition. A transdiagnostic protocol is basically just a protocol, a singular pro protocol that you can use with several diagnoses or several uh, disorders uh, instead of using a per a disorder specific uh, protocol. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of people answering me that they do not have um, exposure experience to transdiagnostic protocols. So as I understand it, for many of you, this will be a uh, first impression or first exposure. Um, so uh, to understand just a little bit about the, uh, the rationale for uh, one protocol for many disorders, uh, if we look just a little bit at the history of the proliferation of disorders, we can see that originally with the first DSM in the 50s, uh, there was only three disorders, so it's very simple. Uh, and then in the uh, 80s, it expanded to nine, disor nine disorders, and then uh, to 12 disorders, and finally in the latest uh, episode of the DSM, we have 27 disorders and also subtypes. So we have lots of different disorders that uh, supposedly we need to understand how to treat each one of them if we're looking at, at them separately. Not only do we have many disorders, but we also have sometimes several protocols for the same disorder. So if we just look at anxiety and PTSD, for example, we can see that each of them have several uh, protocols that you might need to choose from or learn if you now want to uh, use a disorder specific protocol. So this can get very confusing when you're trying to pick up protocols and trying to work with several disorders. Another pro, uh, problem on top of that is a lot of times these disorders are, have uh, comorbid disorders. So for example, if we look at anxiety, often it comes with, um, I have someone saying that they cannot see the slides. Do you see the slides, the, uh, the uh, gray slides currently with the comorbidity? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Someone said they couldn't. <laughs> okay. So, uh, for example, with anxiety, we often have comorbidity with panic, with phobias, with OCD, with PTSD, with sleep disorders. And then in my own experience, we also have uh, uh, comorbidity with subclinical problems. For example, perfectionism, a need for control, uncertainty, avoidance. So now, you have multiple disorders that you're trying to treat, especially when you're using the, uh, the disorder-specific strategy. Um, however, despite the, the large number of protocols available today for different disorders, we see that a lot of them, uh, within the world of CBT, a lot of them have overlapping strategies. So a lot of them uh, touch on exposures, obviously. A lot of them talk, uh, uh, touch on cognitive appraisals or other strategies. Uh, reducing impulsive and safety behaviors, including uh, uh, relaxation uh, uh, strategies, sometimes uh, teaching skills or, or incorporating medication. 
so a lot of these uh, um, facets are actually common to many protocols, even though we have such a large number of them. So what's the rationale for a transdiagnostic protocol? Well, uh, common therapist challenges and questions when using disorders, uh, protocols specific to disorders are which ones do I need to learn for a particular disorder if there are several? How do I integrate if I'm using multiple protocols? Um, if I want to specialize in a disorder, how many protocols do I need to learn? Do I need to learn more than one? Um, do I address comorbid disorders and how do I address them or defensive symptoms and subclinical symptoms? And if there is comorbidity, which one do I target first? And when do I know enough? How many protocols do I need to learn or specialize in to know that I am now uh, can specialize in a disorder? And what about underlying issues like self-esteem or other, <coughs> excuse me, other influences that um, result in the in development of the disorder. So those are some of the, uh, the uh, that's some of the rationale uh, for um, looking at uh, more transdiagnostic protocols that don't, um, aren't specific to a, a disorder. And when we look at the, ex at the um, existing transdiagnostic protocols today, um, there isn't a wide selection of heavily research-based ones. Two of the more well-known ones are the Unified Protocol, uh, David Barlow's UP, and also the Transdiagnostic Group Protocol, uh, Peter Norton, uh, which is obviously for groups. And I'll be referring less to that today, but a little bit up, uh, to uh, David Barlow's UP, the Unified Protocol. Um, so his protocol has uh, seven modules I'm just run, going to run through them quickly. They talk about giving, uh, providing the patient with some psychoeducation, working on motivation for the treatment, increasing the emotional awareness of, uh, of uh, some of the manifestations of emotion, uh, working on uh, certain cognitive appraisals, mostly on uh, probability estimation, what's the chances that something bad is actually going to happen, and decatastrophizing, even if it does happen, how much of a catastrophe it is. Uh, emotionally driven behaviors or impulsive behaviors, uh, exposures to bodily sensations, and then finally wrapping up with uh, relapse uh, prevention. So that's, that's uh, Barlow's um, protocol. And um, it's well-researched. Uh, I have nothing uh, negative to say about his protocol. Um, and it's a very good one. Um, there are some things that came up for me when I, uh, when I provide treatment that um, were not addressed in this protocol. Because we're a little bit limited uh, in time today, I'm not going to go too much into that because I want to save more time for the more practical side. Um, so I'm going to skip over that for today. I do also uh, uh, training on the protocol and there I go more into depth in the theory as well. Um, but what was the rationale for creating the CBT time protocol. Um, well, first of all, at the time, I didn't realize I was developing a transdiagnostic protocol. This started 10 years ago. Um, and at the time, I didn't even know what a transdiagnostic protocol was. I just realized after working in a center for OCD, in an eating disorder clinic, in a hospital, in the acute uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, division, I noticed that I was treating many dis uh, disorders, but uh, there were common mechanisms occurring for these different disorders in terms of uh, negative cognitions, in terms of um, poor emotional tolerance, in terms of impulsive behaviors. Um, and I noticed a lot of similar comorbidity. Um, different disorders were often uh, presenting themselves with um, subclinical symptoms like perfectionism and, and need for control and certainty. Um, <clears throat> Uh, anger, sleep problems, things like that. Uh, and another thing, another thing that I noticed was the core beliefs um, in terms of the uh, patient's self-esteem were often common in terms of how they viewed in themselves along different um, uh, fields or facets of life. Um, and as I started uh, trying to use different strategies, I noticed that similar strategies were having similar effects with patients with different disorders and different backgrounds. Um, and I started uh, developing a certain plan of action that would repeat itself with different patients in different uh, clinics. Um, 
this plan of action had uniform, had very uh, uh, positive results, almost uniform results. Uh, it gave me a clear plan of action and also the patient a clear plan of action on what was going to happen in therapy and how we were going to work on uh, certain uh, skills and, and emotional abilities. Um, and because it also addressed underlying core beliefs, it also gave us confidence in being able to address the cause and not just the symptoms. Um, and I didn't mention before, but I also uh, uh, ran a, um, uh, a network of clinics in CBT for about 10 years. And as I was super supervising uh, therapists, I realized a lot of the different therapists were using different strategies for the same disorders. Um, a lot of them were constantly asking for another protocol or more training or felt they were incapable of dealing with one disorder because they had more experience with another. Um, and so this was giving me a way to uh, pass on to them a more uniform way of looking at different symptoms as part of a uniform problem. So that's the theory in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to move on to the protocol itself and then uh, some of the, the um, skills and exercises that we use in the protocol. Um, first of all, the basic assumptions of the protocol are that all these different symptoms of all these different disorders are actually just a result of negative habits. They're not genetic, they're not biological or biochemical. Um, they're simply a result of poor habits that the patient learned early on with regards to his own uh, thinking styles, his own emotions, um, heeding these behavioral impulses, <clears throat> and that these habits are what actually cause um, the development of anxiety disorders, OCD, eating disorders, um, trichotillomania, sleep problems. All these different disorders are actually based on the same bad habits. So just to give you uh, a few uh, examples of what that might look like. Someone who uh, learned negative thinking at home. Maybe their parents were very critical or judgmental and they learned to, be, they learned to adapt a negative thinking style. They might, uh, as a result, develop more tendency to anxiety, anxiety disorders, or more anger as a result of, uh, of uh, appraising things in a negative fashion. Um, or if they, they haven't learned to tolerate the presence of scary thoughts, weird thoughts, negative thoughts, they might uh, want to control those thoughts or, or fight those thoughts somehow and then develop more tendencies to obsessions uh, and OCD. Uh, if they didn't uh, grow up in an upbringing that uh, taught them it was okay that sometimes our bodies are out of control because the emotions are causing us to have a rapid heartbeat and shaking and sweating and uh, they, they don't know how to tolerate those physiological sensations, then they might appraise them negatively and cause more stress resulting in panic disorder, or they might adopt an avoidance style not to approach or, or engage situations which will cause those sensations and then develop phobias, where they will, um, they will be angry at those triggers in life that cause them to feel that way. If you've ever had a friend that you scared them, and then they got angry at you for scaring them. So that's an example of someone who would have poor tolerance for the fear that they're feeling. And some patients might run off to some sort of chemical suppression of those same emotions using food or drugs in order to try to forcibly uh, uh, calm the body down. And then uh, uh, people who aren't taught to uh, tolerate those behavioral impulses that they experience when they have an emotion might be more impulsive, might heed those fight or flight impulses uh, to avoid, to control, to uh, perfectionism, uh, control freaks, uh, to ruminate, to do some sort of compulsion to resolve the matter, uh, to constantly ask for a certainty or research things or ask other people. And so as a result of uh, heeding these impulses, they're more likely to develop um, these behavior-based disorders such as compulsions of OCD or uh, eating disorders, uh, outbur anger outbursts, et cetera. And another aspect of not knowing how to tolerate and also to relieve tension that we feel or experience as a result of those emotions um, can lead to a buildup of, uh, of emotion or psychokinetic energy, if you will. And then that emotion builds up and causes tension and disquiet. And when patients haven't learned how to 
leave that tension, it can result in certain automatic uh, uh, relief, such as we see in uh, BFRB. Uh, for those who don't know what BFRB, BFRB stands for Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors. So that includes uh, disorders like trichotillomania, uh, which is hair peel pulling, dermatillomania, which is skin picking, uh, uh, nail biting, etc. cetera. Um, we see that with tics. We see that with um, people who, who have built up emotion and then can't fall asleep or sleep right. Uh, people who experience that emotion in, uh, interfering with other functions or other emotions. And then they have uh, sexual dysfunction or arousal problems, concentration problems. Uh, more physical and medical complaints, uh, such as IBMs. Uh, if they have pain disorders, such as fibromyalgia and chronic pain, the tension that they result that they experience will can increase at the pain that they're perceiving and experiencing. So we see that um, that as a result of um, poor ability to to tolerate the presence of negative thoughts without identifying with them, uh, poor ability to tolerate physiological sensations, poor ability to tolerate behavioral impulses can cause us negatively appraising what we're experiencing, which is a natural emotion. And then that negative appraisal increases our stress and increases the symptoms or the behaviors that we're bringing to therapy. So um, this is a, these are a few examples of uh, how these negative habits um, can actually result in, in the development and uh, exacerbation of certain disorders. So what are the goals of the protocol? Uh, obviously we want to reduce negative and stress inducing cognitions and on the other hand, increase uh, positive cognitions and self-esteem. Um, and we'll see later on why that's important to reducing stress and then reducing symptoms. We want to increase emotional tolerance and as a result, the habituation that results. Uh, we wanna increase positive emotions and I'll talk about that later also what a positive emotion is. We want to reduce heating of impulsive behaviors and increase more adaptive behaviors and effective emotional release rather than letting the emotion build up. So those are the goals of the protocol. They're very simple goals. Um, and we split those goals up into three modules. We have the cognitive module, the emotion module, and the behavioral. And the cognitive, obviously, we want to decrease the negative thoughts and the rumination. We want to increase positive thoughts uh, which includes uh, motivational thinking and self-esteem. The emotion module, we want to increase uh, the stressful thoughts and increase positive emotions. And in the behavioral module, we want to decrease either impulsive behaviors or a lack of release uh, or lack of tension release. And we want to increase uh, adaptive behaviors and tension release behaviors. So uh, the protocol is split up into these uh, three modules. And um, we start off in the protocol, protocol with uh, psychoeducation, explaining uh, to the patient how the uh, emotional system works on a, on a biological level so that they can understand how the poor habits that they have are actually causing more of what they're trying to stop. Um, and then how we want to identify those bad habits and replace them with healthier habits. And um, Basically, uh, I'll go into it just a little bit. You have uh, in the uh, printed protocol, there's a, a very in-depth description, that example that I give my patients explaining this uh, psychoeducation, this process. I'm not gonna give that whole example now, but I am just gonna give you a little uh, sample of the message that uh, we try to relay the patients. <coughs> and it starts off with explaining to them that um, in the front of the brain, we have the, uh, the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, which uh, contains the logical uh, part of our brain, which is very advanced and has evolved very nicely. And then uh, more towards the back or center in the limbic system, we have the emotional brain, which is a lot more primitive and hasn't evolved it as much and doesn't understand a lot of what's going on up today in the frontal cortex, which is capable of very advanced thought, thinking about uh, hypotheticals and about future, what can happen, uh, work and relationships and friendships. And the emotional brain is still stuck in its primitive prehistoric looking for monsters and survival modes. So a lot of the time that uh, emotional brain, I call it the uh, four-year-old child, doesn't understand what's going on up here. I call it the professor. 
and so the emotional brain or the four-year-old doesn't understand half the time what the professor is talking about, but the four-year-old is still responsible for pushing buttons and releasing adrenaline and cortisol and norepinephrine and all these chemicals into the body. <clears throat> and so sometimes there's just a mistake in the, in the message and that child is pushing that button unnecessarily and causing us stress emotions and adrenaline responses, which we don't really need in the moment, which is why we experience fear in a horror movie, even though there's no danger in a horror movie and our logic knows this, or in a roller coaster, or in a first date, or an exam, or, or <clears throat> a child sleeping in the dark. We have endless, endless situations and examples where our emotional brain is misunderstanding our logical brain today and starts pushing that button and causing those uh, uh, adrenaline and cortisol hormones to, to spread and cause a stress response. So we want the patient to understand that they are actually uh, sending messages to the emotional brain and, and reinforcing a stress response that they don't want. And we want to learn how we do that and what, what, and what we can do instead in order to stop that from happening. And um, I begin by showing them that there's a certain emotional pipeline that occurs uh, and it starts off with a, a trigger X, which, which can be an external event like uh, uh, divorce or uh, you know, being fired from job or uh, COVID-19, uh, or it can be something internal. I thought about something, I remembered something, I had a dream about something, I felt something in my body, something uncomfortable or had a, 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 an emotion that I didn't understand why I had it. Even internal triggers can cause uh, stress. Um, but I explain the to the patient that the process that they go through starts, first of all, with interpretation. There's an eyeball because it's how we look at it. And the interpretation will dictate how much stress we have. So if we get fired and we say, well, that sucks, you know, but I'll survive. Uh, lots of people get fired and I have a bit of savings and I'll find another job. And well, then, you know, I might be sad, but I'm not going to be terribly stressed. But I get, if I give it a negative interpretation, like, oh my God, why did he fire me? What's wrong with me? What am I going to do? Am I going to find a job and take care of my kids? That kind of interpretation is going to cause a much um, more um, 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 stressful response. So we, we start off by looking at the way you, the patient, are uh, interpreting various events. Then when we get to that stress response, which is going to happen because there's no life without stress, um, then we're going to look at how you uh, tolerate that stress. So if you know how to tolerate it, it's going to diminish with time. And if you don't know how to tolerate it, you might end up exacerbating it. And finally, we're going to look at what you do with all that emotion. Are you going to let the four-year-old child dictate your behavior by, with a fight or flight or avoid response? Or are you going to choose a better way to, uh, to relieve that emotion? So, um, and for this as well, there's a very nice in-depth description in the protocol. Uh, I'm just cutting to the chase right now for the sake of time. So the, the first thing that we do when we start working with the patient in the protocol is uh, we start working with the negative thoughts. And uh, not only because it's the beginning of the emotional pipeline, but also because it's very relevant to the therapy process itself. Because what the patient does in real life outside the therapy, they're going to do in the therapy room. So if they, if they have a tendency to appraise things negatively, to not know how to deal with the uncertainty, well, they're gonna have that in the therapy process as well. Things are not always gonna go the way they want. They're not always gonna be clear about what needs to happen. And then they're gonna have negative appraisals in the therapy process as well, which may potentially sabotage the therapy process. So we really want to be aware of those uh, cognitions. And it's another reason to start, first of all, with the negative thoughts. So what's our focus here? So I'm just gonna take a little sip. <clears throat> so our primary focus here is to reduce the presence of thoughts that trigger the emotional brain, that trigger that stress response. And then that stress response can result in the symptomatic behavior that they don't want, uh, whether it's running away from the emotion in phobias, or um, ruminating about the emotions, which can cause increased emotions and panic disorders, trying to fight the emotions such as compulsions and eating behaviors or, or controlling others aggressively. So we wanna reduce that stress by reducing the thoughts that trigger that stress or that exacerbate it if there's a natural stress occurring from just a, a, a regular event in life. Um, but how do we do this? So um, 
we're trying to keep the the uh, cognitive appraisal and cognitive challenges as simple as possible. Obviously, in some uh, strategies, we really get into in depth into the content of the thoughts and challenging them, checking how uh, uh, grounded they are, what are the chances, etc. But um, right now, we're trying to focus specifically on that adrenaline response. And so we want to focus on what it is in the thought process that causes that adrenaline response. Now, we have a very primitive emotional brain. And the emotional brain doesn't understand what jobs are in relationships and, and friends and future and hypotheticals. So what if if it doesn't understand what all this content is, how is it deciding when to push that button and trigger that adrenaline response? And so our, uh, our strategy is that uh, it, it has nothing to do with the content or context itself. It's rather keywords that we use around context. And these keywords are keywords that actually um, are universal and repeat themselves uh, with all the different types of context that we have in our lives. And when we use these keywords, we're actually sending a trigger to our emotional brain. Okay, this is a situation that requires an adrenaline response. And so what are these keywords? These keywords are words that, um, that send an uh, uh, absolute message in terms of there are good options and bad options when looking at the situation. Uh, so the example I give the patients are if a um, child's going off to school and has his first exam and the parents tell him, um, you know, hey, listen, you have an exam, you need to study well, you need to get good grades. Without good grades, you won't succeed in life, you won't get anywhere. Okay, you have to, to do well in school. And now the patient goes off, uh, the child goes off to school and only gets a 60 on their exam. And then I ask the patient, how do you think this, uh, the kid would react to that grade? And usually the patients notice they'd be very stressed. And then I give another example, the child is going off to his first exam and the parents say, listen, you know, try to study and get a good grade. You know, it can help you. And even if you don't get a good grade, it, it's fine. You know, just do your best. You know, just one grade, just one exam. It's not everything in life. It's fine. And then the kid goes off and gets a 60. And then I ask the patient again what they think the response is. It's going to be the same stressful response. And they say, no, they're probably going to be less stressed. But what's the difference? And we have the exact same context, a child going off to their first uh, exam and parents who want them to succeed. So if the context hasn't changed, what has changed? These absolute words that we use in order to break the possibilities into good and bad. If we don't break up the possibilities, we've maintained the, patient, the child's confidence and then they don't have that stress response. But if we break their confidence that all options are okay, now they're in preparation mode not to reach these consequences and then they get stressed if they do or they start to make conclusions that there's something wrong with them. <coughs> Excuse me. So what are these keywords? What are these absolute words that we use? Um, I've tried to translate as well as I can into English. Um, the words we can see here on the right side, some common absolute words. Um, some of them might be uh, um, um, familiar from uh, Ellis, for example. Words like uh, judgmental words or absolutism words like must or should uh, or bad. Um, I expect something to happen. Um, uh, judgmental evaluations like it's too much or not enough or wrong. And even questions like why and what if. All these, all these words which repeat themselves in different situations will break the uh, child or the emotional brain's confidence that everything's okay and then he uh, reacts with uh, preparation or survival mode by starting to release um, uh, adrenaline and causing tension. It might be very subtle tension, 10, 20%, or it might be very high tension causing anxiety, but it's going to create that emotional response. And we can see, for example, on the left side, we also have words uh, encouraging us to act and achieve a goal, but there's no absolutism here and there's no threat of uh, uh, c catastrophe. So we use softer words like prefer and desire and strive. If something doesn't happen, it's not wrong or bad. It's just a pity, but okay, I'll survive. We don't use judgmental uh, evaluations like too much or not enough, just much or few. And instead of uh, obsessing about why, we just accept things that we don't understand and there's uncertainty, say la vie. And then in these situations, uh, the confidence is maintained. The child or the emotional brain's confidence is maintained and there's, he's a lot more calm or if something unpleasant happens, he's still sad, but a lot less stressed. 
So these are the keywords, the red flags that trigger the, the uh, survival response that we don't want in many situations, regardless of the content in the context. And so these are the words that we're looking for. And we show the patient that when these uncomfortable situations happen, whether we can look at the X over here, whether it's a divorce or firing or economic stress, et cetera, uh, everyone's gonna be stressed at some point. Um, but what happens when they experience the stress? If someone gives themselves a green flag response, it's unpleasant, you know, it's gonna be hard, it's very sad for me, but okay, I'll move on. Then that em emotion habituates with time. And if the situation reoccurs, the emotion reoccurs, but less and less from time to time as they um, or, uh, undergo the habituation. And I ask the patients, um, you know, if you imagine yourself in a first date versus a, a date, you know, several months in or first day on the job, several months on the job, if you can remember that initial stress that you accepted as natural and tolerated, and then it just diminished with time. And then here on the left side, we see um, the same trigger and the same initial uh, stress but here we have a person uh, responding with red flags. Why am I feeling like this? Something must be wrong. This is bad. This shouldn't be happening. I expected my, uh, more for myself. And these red flags create additional stress response. And now we have uh, anxiety or panic attacks. And they also increase uh, the emotional behaviors or the impulse behaviors of fight or flight. So we see the behavior uh, more towards uh, avoidance of phobia, or controlling the emotion with eating disorders or, uh, or OCD compulsions or controlling others and anger outbursts, et cetera. So we see more of that emotion, more of those behaviors. So we're trying to uh, uh, show the patient that they are actually exacerbating their stress and their symptomatic behavior when they are trying to judge and control this primary emotion by causing a negative cycle. So for example, if they, um, if they had uh, uh, poor night's sleep. Now during COVID, I'm hearing a lot of those. And then they give it a negative interpretation. Oh, I didn't sleep well, I'm gonna be tired tomorrow, it's gonna be hard to function, I'm not gonna be at my best. Uh, and other, <coughs> another negative interpretation. So that's gonna cause more stress, especially when they get into the bed and expect to sleep. And it's going to also affect their ability to sleep. And then the more they continue to appraise that negatively, the more they're going to uh, stress they're going to be, and the more they're going to have that behavior. Same thing goes with um, eating disorders. You know, a person had an, an unpleasant event, they gave it a, a negative interpretation, they felt bad, they didn't know how to tolerate those feelings, they decided to eat to make themselves feel bad, uh, to feel better, but then they judged themselves and criticized themselves for that eating behavior and its consequences that negative appraisal causes more stress, more need to either eat or to compensate for the eating with purging uh, or other, or, or, or vomiting or other behaviors. And we see the same negative cycle in OCD. We see the same negative cycle in anger outbursts and, and other behaviors. So we, we try to help the patient take responsibility for the negative cycle they're creating um, with their red flag thinking. <clears throat> now, some patients will relate to the idea rather simply when they understand that there's a certain style of thinking, red flag thinking that causes stress. I found that they relate to the idea very simply, but when it comes to the practice, it's not always easy for them to just give up on years of habit of a way of thinking. So uh, when I asked them to convert the red flag to a green flag in the same thinking that we've recognized, in some examples, it might be very easy for them to do so. But in another example, they might feel very challenged and say, no, no, this is really not okay. This is really wrong and, and, and reflects badly on me. And after years of thinking that way, it's, it's hard for them to just give up on that style of thinking. And so here we have a tool that helps them uh, challenge their old way of thinking. It's a courtroom technique where we ask um, the patient to identify that red flag thinking, and we call that the prosecutor who's coming into the courtroom and yelling something very negative and trying to get the courtroom to, you know, to activate the survival system and do something because we need to fight the situation. 
Um, and then we want to take responsibility as, as an objective and responsible judge of not immediately listening to and adopting that, uh, that thought. <laughs> but now taking the time to evaluate objectively vis-a-vis -vis our logic. And how do we know what a logical thought is? It's a logic, it's a thought that stands the test of objectivity, statistics, science, evidence, experience, facts. And here we need to ask questions, because if we don't ask questions, we don't know if it stood the test of logic and if it truly is logical thinking or if we're just rationalizing to ourselves the emotional thinking. And so we have, um, we have techniques to help the patient and questions that we have to help the patient understand um, is this logical thinking or not? And again, we want to keep it very simple. We don't want to get too, too much into subjective arguments with the patient because they can always think of another, yeah, but maybe, but what if, uh, or just subjectively, I don't want to accept this. We want to adhere specifically to the adrenaline response. You know, and we ask the patient, this adrenaline response, you need to choose an approach to life when you want to use it. Do you only want to use it for situations for which it was intended, which are obviously survival situations when you need adrenaline to hit somebody or to run away? Or do you want to experience that adrenaline response in every unpleasant situation in life, in every uncertain situation in life, um, and then have a lot more stress and a lot more of those symptomatic behaviors that you don't want? And obviously the patients say, no, I want less stress. Okay, then that means you need to choose an approach in life where you do not justify that adrenaline response if it's not a survival situation. And that's what we're trying to check in the courtroom. Is this situ a situation which requires an immediate adrenaline response? Because if it doesn't require an immediate adrenaline response, then it doesn't justify using a red flag in your thinking. So if you're insisting on using a red flag, even though you haven't been able to prove that you need an adrenaline response, then you've just adopted a guilty until proven innocent, a uh, guilty until proven innocent approach in life, which means you're going to immediately take a negative thought, hold on to it, even if it increases that adrenaline response, <clears throat> instead of choosing an innocent until proven guilty approach, which means I am not going to justify an adrenaline response unless I've been able to prove that I really need it. And obviously, when I ask the patient, how much stress do you have in life versus how many survival situations have you had recently? The ratio is 99.9% .9 not justified to maybe once a year or less justified. So if most of the time it's not justified, then let's choose that innocent and proven guilty approach, which means we don't uh, uh, identify with, we don't justify with that uh, response until we've checked it out and proven that it's really needed. If you decide to say, no, I insist, this is wrong, it's bad, it's too much, it's not okay. Okay, then we reflect to the patient, you've just selected the guilty until proven innocent an approach, which means you're going to experience an exacerbation of that stress response that you've been saying you don't want to experience. You want the other approach. Another side keeps saying, uh, justify the response. Uh, the adrenaline response and not control it or stop it because we can't control that initial response. You know, we see a cockroach, uh, we see uh, something scary on TV, uh, somebody uh, broke up with us or fired us. We're going to have that initial response. We cannot stop it. But do we agree with it and justify it? Or we, do we say that was an unjustified response like I have when I see a horror movie and I don't need to engage it and justify it? So, our questions uh, in the courtroom are specifically to uh, uh, evaluate whether this situation requires that immediate adrenaline response. It's not whether the situation is true or not. You know, so if a woman will say, uh, um, hey, my husband left me. Okay, in the courtroom, you know, will the courtroom say, okay, now we need to act, you know, get the police involved and, and other things. No. Because whether something is true or not does not mean it justifies an adrenaline response. So even if the husband left the wife, does that require an adrenaline response? So that's what we're looking for. A very simple focus and justification of that adrenaline response, which is our, what the red flags are supposed to be used for. Any other use of the red flags are not justified in terms of the adrenaline response. Now, 
the, sometimes the patients, the idea to them is very clear. If this is not an adrenal situation, fine. But sometimes they say, hey, you know what? It, I don't know. There's uncertainty. For example, I have a phobia of driving. It could happen. I could have a car ex accident. And you're right. There is uncertainty. But when you have that uncertainty, what do you want to do with it? What approach do you want to use? Do you always want to guess guilty and stress out about every possible uncertainty in life? Because if you do, then you're going to have a lot of unnecessary uncertainty in most of those situations and nothing happened because you've survived till now. Or do you want to choose an innocent or proven guilty approach? Which means if I haven't been able to prove something in uncertainty, I don't want to trigger that response. And this is a very common, no matter what disorder I'm working with, this is a very common a difficulty for the patients to work with that uncertainty. Because most of these patients, if not all, they have a lot of difficulty trusting themselves that they'll be okay when they have that uncertainty. They don't have the self-confidence to trust themselves that they'll be fine, they'll manage, even if they fall, it's okay. So they're constantly trying to, to escape that uncertainty and overcompensate with certainty, with control, with perfectionism, so that now they know everything is okay. And when that works, it's great, it's a bonus. But what if it doesn't work? Or what if it works, but you're so stressed in the process all the time? or sometimes life doesn't allow you to achieve the certainty and control you want. What then? If you can't achieve it and you don't know how to be in uncertainty, the only option left is now to start identifying with your fears and believing that really something wrong or something bad is gonna happen. <clears throat> so if you uh, use that guilty until proven innocent approach, you're gonna stay down here and constantly guess bad things if you can't prove everything is okay. So we don't wanna prove innocent. We want to prove guilty, innocent until proven guilty. And those are our questions also when we ask them. And I'm not going to get in, into the questions today uh, uh, because we don't have uh, time, um, but you have it in the protocol, lot, lots of examples. Um, by the way, I see some questions here. What is time in the CBT-10 protocol? So time stands for tolerance of, uh, sorry, targeting the intolerance of manifested emotions. So patients don't know how to tolerate one or more of the manifestations, whether it be thought, feeling, or um, the behavioral impulses. Um, another question about the protocol. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you an option to, um, uh, with a link to leave your email if you want to receive the protocol at the end. Okay, so uh, we're gonna do a very quick uh, practice. We're not gonna break out into groups because uh, I want to get to a lot with you and we don't uh, have the time. So we're going to do this briefly. And what I'm going to ask you to do, and you, you can do this on yourselves, is to think about a situation that causes you, uh, you know, to say that it causes you stress or anger or a situation that you tend to avoid because it's just uncomfortable. And I want you to think about that situation for a moment. And then I want you to try to uh, uh, identify what is the red flag in that situation that is causing you stress. I have to do something. It's not okay or it's wrong if it doesn't happen. I expect this person to act a certain way. Um, if, if I don't do this, I'm not good enough. Why did I do, do this? Why did I feel this way? Why did I think that? Try to think of a situation that triggers you and to identify the red flag that you have when thinking about that situation. And again, it doesn't matter what situation, what we're focused on, is specifically that red flag. Okay, so I'm gonna give you about uh, uh, 10 seconds to try to uh, think of a situation and what red flag uh, you have when considering that uh, situation. Okay, I hope you, you were able to think of one and if not, you can always watch the recording later and pause it and try to do this exercise. <clears throat> and now what I want you to do is I want you to ask yourself, is this a situation that really requires an immediate adrenaline response? Is this a situation that requires me now to, you know, get this cortisol and adrenaline in my body to hit someone, to run away right away, otherwise I'm in a life and death situation? I'm hoping for most of you, you thought of examples where that was not the case. And if it is the case, then you're justified in using the red flag. But hopefully uh, you thought of a typical day-to-day -day situation, which was not a survival situation. And then we want to ask ourselves, okay, 
is this situation a survival response? Does it require an adrenaline response? No. Is this situation um, uh, um, uh, familiar? Is it a human situation? Is it a normative situation? Or is it a situation that no one's ever heard of and we have no idea what can happen? Like an alien is coming from outer space and we don't know if he's gonna kill us all or not. You know, so I'm guessing most of you, if not all of you have chosen just a, a human and normative situation. And then the last question would be, um, is this a situation which is permanent, necessarily permanent for all of life, like a cancer, or is it something that has the potential to change or potential for us to work on it or to pass it, that it happens, but then we move on and move on from it, like, uh, um, you know, a hard breakup and I feel really bad, but there is a potential to move on from it. Um, or we had a bad fight, but we can work on it, etc. So now let's look at just those three questions. If this is not a situation uh, of immediate threat, of a survival situation, if this is a normative or hum human situation, if this is a situation which has the potential to change and we can move on from it, is this the kind of situation where we want to approach life pressing that adrenaline button every time we run into a situation like this? If not, then we don't have justification for that red flag which means when that four-year-old child in the back of their, our brain spoke out of habit and used specifically a red flag when looking at that situation, must, need, shouldn't, not okay, too much, that habit of, of ours is not justified. If we were the responsible judge right now, we wouldn't justify that, that language. It's gonna pop up, we can't stop it, we can't control it, but we don't need to engage it, identify it, and exacerbate it even more, because that's just gonna trigger more of an adrenaline response. So we would say, not guilty. We would say, the use here of a red flag is not justified if we do not want that adrenaline response. Okay, and if a patient tries to separate between the, you know, the two, no, I don't want the adrenaline response, but it's really not okay. All right, so if you're insisting that it's not okay, you're insisting on using a red flag. So just remember that you can't pick the emotion. The minute, the minute you've used that red flag, you've guaranteed an emotion. So you decide, you know, do you want to insist on this old habit of using red flags on a situation that doesn't require an adrenaline response? And we don't fight the patient on it. We just you know, reflect to them what they do to themselves and let them take responsibility for it. And even if it's difficult for them on the first day or the first try, maybe after a couple of weeks of this, it'll be easier for them to identify what they keep doing to themselves. So that was the, uh, the, the first example, uh, uh, the red flags that we want to use. And we're gonna use these consistently throughout therapy because the patient is constantly going to judge and expect and criticize himself or things in therapy. They're gonna constantly have trouble with uncertainty and then try to run off to negative expectations. So we need to be aware of those negative uh, cognitions and those red flags throughout the therapy process so that they don't sabotage. And of course, we need to be aware of our own red flags so that we don't stress out when the patient's uh, stressing us out. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from the red flags. Um, again, there's a lot more about it in depth in the complete protocol or in, in the uh, course, the training course, if anyone's interested. We just don't have the time to go in today, so I'm gonna move on to the next thing. And the next thing that we want, to, uh, the second and the last thing we want to do with negative thinking is look at the framing uh, um, or the timing and frequency and duration of those thoughts, regardless of the content. So we're not looking now at the content at all. Uh, we're not trying to challenge anything. We're just looking at the time spent because every moment you spent engaged in a negative thought or a red flag is a moment that you are increasing your stress response. And patients who have a tendency to ruminate, anxious patients, angry patients, uh, obsessive patients and others, these are patients who are creating, with their constant negative thinking, they're creating a lot more stress responses in the body. And again, those stress responses will lead later into those behavioral symptoms that they don't want, regardless of whether it's eating or avoidance or uh, compulsions, uh, et cetera. So uh, what we wanna do is reduce that ruminate, uh, ruminations. And the way we wanna do it is we wanna give a framework or, or very simple rules to the patient on when to think, regardless of what the content is. And so uh, we do that with the very simple rules uh, that we ask the patient to follow. And those rules, uh, there are five rules. 
I'm sorry for the circle. Um, there were originally four rules and then I added one and I'm not very creatively uh, gifted. So I didn't know how to create the five in this circle, but it's five rules. And the rules are, I call them laws. And the reason the laws are, first of all, they're always correct for everybody. And secondly, when we violate those laws, we are not actually contributing to our thinking process. We're actually hurting ourselves, so to speak, by creating additional stress. And so uh, these are the laws. And actually, I don't, I don't actually tell the laws to the patients. I always ask them in their logical brain what they think the answer is, and they always answer me correctly. So I ask them, not what you're doing today, but in your logical brain, how many times do we need to think about the same thing if there's no new data? And patients will tell me once if there's nothing new. And that's the logical response. The emotional brain sometimes wants to revisit something again and again because they don't like uncertainty. Or maybe they don't like the response and they want a better response. And so they push us to rethink things. That's obsessive thinking. That's emotional thinking that's ruminating that only triggers more time of thinking and more stress responses. So the patient, we tell them that we think about it uh, once. And, uh, and if that's difficult for you, then we'll do it once a day. Because it's hard to say I thought about it two weeks ago. Fine, you thought about it today, don't think about it anymore. You can think about it tomorrow again. Second law is, and again, I ask the patient, once you have all the data that you're gonna have, regardless of whether you have certainty or not, how much time do we need logically to just make a conclusion? This is my choice, this is the conclusion, etc. And normally patients know to say, this part of the process is very quick. You know, and I give them an example of uh, buying mortgage 30 years, you know, and can't regret. But once I've done all the, and checking in the houses and the consulting and done the you know, pros and cons of each house. Now I need to make a decision. Logically, how much time do I need? It's very quick. But you know, sometimes the emotional brain is afraid of making a mistake and so wants to be sure and can't trust ourselves. And then we end up thinking about things for 10, 20, 30 minutes or sometimes all day. So that's the second law that it needs to be very brief. And even if we have uncertainty, we still need to choose our innocent until proven guilty approach and uncertainty so we don't uh, try to continue thinking just because we have the uncertainty. The third law is the data relevancy. Okay, what is the point of thinking about something before I have enough data or before I can do something about it? You know, oh my gosh, what if I failed the exam? What am I going to do with my future? Wait, hold on for the test results before you start getting stressed about it. I did some blood tests. What if they find a disease? What am I going to do? Wait, let's wait for, for the blood test results before we start uh, stressing about that. Because there's an infinite number of things that we can stress about before we can do anything about it in that approach. So let's wait till it's relevant and only then think about it. <clears throat> Fourth rule is situational relevance, which means, you know, I'm trying to concentrate in a staff meeting or I'm trying to enjoy date night and all of a sudden a stressful thought pops in my brain. Is this the time that I want to think about it? And along the way, just ruin my functioning at work or my enjoyment? Is this really the best time to think about it? If not, then I'll postpone it till later instead of ruining other things for myself. <clears throat> and the fifth law uh, that I added later is emotional availability, which means if I'm currently in the middle of a stress response, I'm very anxious, I'm angry, etc. Is this really the best time to try to think logically? Or am I, is my thinking too corrupt by all these negative emotional thoughts? Maybe I should wait till this uh, adrenaline wave passes and then try to think later about the things. So I need to be emotionally available. And those are the five laws uh, of logical thought. And then I give a patient uh, an exercise that I detail in the, in the protocol about, um, about, you know, once a day you're allowed to think about your problems. You know, so you can set to end of the day, seven o'clock, that's the time you can sit on our previous table when we work on red flags. That's the time you can think about your problems. The rest of the day, if it's not an immediate life and death situation, you postpone it. You don't think about it at the same moment. And, and so they have an exercise where they only once a day can think about things and the rest of the day they postpone. But how do you postpone something that is, you know, knocking in your head all day? So then here we give them uh, um, certain techniques to help them stop ruminating. And when, when we stop ruminating, again, we're not trying to stop that initial primary response because we have no control over it. We're trying to stop the secondary response that we cause when we ruminate and cause an increase uh, uh, additional adrenaline. So we explained this to the patient. You're not going to calm down now. You're not going to feel no response. The thoughts are not going to disappear. 
All we're trying to do is stop you from ruminating and exacerbating even more. And so we do this in a number of ways. Uh, my favorite is grandma, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll detail that one briefly. Basically what I do is I tell them to find an object. So here's the one I have in the clinic. And I say, here's your uh, little child. And I want you to imagine that the little child now is screaming all these negative things. So take a situation that's bothering you. You know, try to identify those negative thoughts and then project them onto this little thing. And pretend that's, you know, that's like a grandchild, that's the little child yelling things. And then what I want you to do is I want you to uh, uh, look at that object, you know, pretend that, you know, they're yelling at you all these things. And I want you to respond like this, cross your arms, nod your head and just go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so now what we're doing is we're not agreeing, but we're not disagreeing. We're not exacerbating, oh my God, what if that's true? But we're also not trying to calm down. We're staying in our uncertainty zone. Okay, we're not trying to escape to uh, a certainty, but also not identifying with our fear. We're staying in that uncertainty zone. And that's really uncomfortable. But that's what we're trying to learn to be in that uncertainty zone. So don't expect to feel good, but uh, uh, try it. And so we invite the patient and I do this with them in the clinic. And they say, but it's still there, but it's still there. And I say, yeah, if you have a grandkid, you know, you can't throw them out the window. They're going to keep screaming, but you don't need to answer them. So let them be and do that technique. And, and uh, neutral responses are similar. You know, you answer things like maybe, I don't know, could be. Um, leaves in the river are a mindfulness technique. And then we do distractions, but I always do distractions at the end because otherwise the patient will expect that if they do the distraction, now they'll have quiet in their mind. So first of all, I want them to learn to accept and tolerate the presence of those thoughts while they're not exacerbating them. Okay, so let's try this one really quickly. Uh, I want again to ask you guys to think about something and you can use the same example as before. Something that, that, um, that makes you uncomfortable or stresses you out. Maybe it's something currently going on in your life, a problem, an issue, a stress, something that you're avoiding or makes you upset. And what I want you to do is if you have some object nearby, even a pen, you can hold, a, hold it. If you don't have anything, just you know, use your hand like a puppet. And try to imagine now that all these negative thoughts are coming from this external object. <clears throat> and you're going to look at this external object, imagine that these negative thoughts are coming from this object. And what I want you to practice doing, and you can do this out loud, you know, all your microphones are muted so nobody can hear you. Uh, and the only thing that you're gonna say out loud is, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And if you really want to challenge yourself, you can try saying, maybe, yeah, I don't know, could be, you know, and just practice answering only that out loud. So I'm going to give you another uh, 20 seconds now. And I want you to uh, project onto some sort of uh, object, these negative voices, accept that they're not going away and just practice out loud saying, mm -hmm, I don't know, could be, maybe. Okay, so go ahead and think of an example uh, try responding like that. Uh, let's do it for about uh, 20 seconds, uh, and I'm going to be quiet in the meantime. Okay, so uh, hopefully that was enough for you. And again, you can always go back to the recordings and, and practice some more, or just get the idea down. And again, this is heavily detailed in the, in the protocol. And that's, that's all we're doing with the rumination. We're just cutting down the time that they're spending thinking about things, which is causing additional stress, which is later causing uh, the symptomatic behaviors. Okay, and we can give them a very simple exercise. I usually ask them to review the five laws every day because they're very short. And I give them an exercise where they're allowed once a day to think about things. And the rest of the day, they need to postpone. And I'll ask them to do something like put a reminder on their phone every hour so that they can check if they're thinking in the moment. And if so, practice one of the exercises that I just showed you to postpone the ruminating till later. And I find this is a rather simple exercise and a lot of patients do it and they find out that it cuts their rumination down significantly. Okay, so um, we finished with the negative thoughts. Um, 
at least the, the clearly negative ones, um, by either uh, re reducing their negative value vis-a-vis -vis the red flags, or by just uh, uh, shortening the amount of time that they're engaged in those thoughts. Now, a frequent problem is uh, patients who are used to their whole lives using stress to function and to action, even if they don't agree with the stress, it's hard for them to know how to now <clears throat> motivate themselves to act without the use of stress. You know, I got to get up for work. I need to, to get the kids re ready for school. You know, I, I, I have to do my part at, at, at home. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I forgot the, uh, the shopping that, that my wife asked me. You know, that's bad. And so they're constantly using this as an everyday part of language. And then when we take this away, they don't know how to, how to you know, sometimes motivate themselves to work. They're afraid they're not going to study. They're afraid they're not going to, you know, advance at work if they don't stress themselves. So it's really important to give them a, another leg to stand on besides stress. And here's where motivational thinking comes in. We want to teach them how to use their other emotions to create drive, to create motivation besides using stress. I mean, stress is great. It's a really powerful emotion, but it's got a lot of consequences. It, uh, it lowers your self-esteem, creates negative thoughts and sensations. Sometimes the behavioral impulse is exactly the opposite of what you want. I got to study, and now you're experiencing avoidance. So we want to teach the pa patient how to motivate themselves without the use of stress. <clears throat> and so there's a formula. The protocol uses a rather simple formula to create positive uh, motivation, a positive drive without the use of stress. And the two de uh, elements are desire and belief. So desire is, you know, I want this thing. I want pizza. I want to go out and buy pizza and eat pizza because I love the pizza. That's a very simple primary desire. But what if I don't have a primary desire? Like I want to study for my exam. No, I don't really want to study for my exam. So now I don't have primary desire. But I do have secondary desire. What secondary desire? I do want a good grade on the exam and I want to get my degree and I want to get a good job and a good uh, uh, salary and I want to be proud of myself and feel capable. I do want those things. And if studying for the exam gets me those things, then yeah, I want to study for the exam. And that's secondary desire. And a lot of times people don't think about the secondary desire and then all they're left with is using stress in order to study or do something else. So we, have, we help them identify their primary and second desires but desire is not enough. And why not? An example I give the patients is when I was a child, I used to jump off the couch with my brother trying to fly around like Superman. Now, obviously it didn't work. And after a while, I stopped. And then I asked the patient, do you know why you stopped? And usually they give me some variation of, you know, you realized it won't work. You know, you stop believing that it can happen. And that's exactly right. Belief is the second uh, um, ingredient you need to create desire. Without belief, you will not feel that motivation. Now, belief doesn't have to be a certainty. In fact, it's not certainty, because with certainty, there's no belief. Belief is in the possibility, in the chance. And then I give an example. There were another two brothers that also wanted to fly, and they decided to believe that it is possible. And they had no logical reason to believe it's possible. It had never been done before. But they chose to believe it's possible. And that, combined with their desire, created a motivation to try and try and try and try until they created the, fly, the plane, obviously the Wright brothers. And so we have to have a belief that something is possible and focus on that belief, otherwise we won't experience that motivation. And then the last ingredient is actually a lack of ingredient. And the lack of ingredient is a lack of red flags, because red flags are the gas of the stress engine. And the stress engine will always get, will always have priority on other engines because it's a, uh, a survival engine. So it's always more important in terms of the body's priority. So we want to make sure we're not triggering that stress response. Otherwise, we're not going to enjoy the motivation. That's why we're trying to enjoy ourselves with friends, but it's hard to enjoy because we have um, the stress or we're trying to enjoy a sexual functioning, but we're too stressed out. We're trying to sleep, but we're too stressed out because that stress receives priority. So we need to make sure that we're not causing stress. What causes stress? Red flags. So we need to make sure we're not using red flags, for example, expectations that I'll succeed, uh, focusing on the doubt or the chance that I won't succeed, uh, criticizing myself if I don't succeed. All these patterns will increase stress and then sabotage my positive motivation. So our formula looks like this. 
primary desire plus secondary desire minus, uh, sorry, plus belief minus doubt. So you have an example here. I want to study tonight because I want a good grade and a degree and a salary and a pride. And I believe that I can because I've studied lots of times in the past and I was able to feel good in the past. And then I made it this far, so I'm not totally stupid. And I have time tonight. I made time tonight and this weekend. So yeah, I, I can do it. And even if I don't, well, that sucks. It's unfortunate, but fine, I'll survive. I'm not gonna die. So I'll try again tomorrow. It's happened before, you know? I'll try again tomorrow, I'll try to make up the time, or I'll have a makeup exam, life will go on. I prefer to try and fail rather than avoid or criticize myself. And so when we put this all together, we have a nice motivational uh, uh, sentence. And then I use the patient with their examples. And by the way, their examples might have nothing to do with their symptom. The symptom is the end of the pipeline. This is the kind of stuff that feeds into their pipeline. So I ask them to do this on everyday stuff, stuff that they're already doing, it's stressed about, or stuff that they don't do because they're trying to use stress to achieve it. You know, maybe some uh, organizing a trip or, or some plans for the weekend. So let's do a quick practice on this. Uh, I'm going to ask you now to think of something that you do uh, on day-to-day -day basis or on a weekly basis, but normally when you do it, you do it kind of at a sense of duty and must or stress. You know, I need to do this. I need to get up for work. I have to get this done. Uh, the kids, I brush my teeth, I do the groceries. Um, try to think of something like that that you do with stress. Uh, and if you can't think of anything, then think of something that you don't do uh, because you avoid it because, um, uh, not because you really think it's going to be a catastrophe, but it's hard for you to get the motivation to, to do that thing. And I want you to think of that example, you know, this thing that you do normally with stress. And if you can agree quickly, that it's not really a situation that justifies a red flag. It's not really a justify a situation that justifies adrenaline response. Then we can uh, agree that the red flag is unjustified here and we shouldn't be using it. And so what we want to do is we want to rephrase this, uh, this desire according to this formula. So try now to create a formula using the example in your minds uh, focusing on the direct thing that you want to do. And it has to be a very clear behavior. It can't be, I want to feel good because you need to do something. I can't, I want to sleep well. Yeah, but how do you do that practically? It needs to be a practical behavior for the primary uh, desire. So think of a primary desire, something practically you want to do. Think of all the reasons why, why you want that. You know, maybe I want to do groceries because I want to be a good husband. I want to, you know, feel like a responsible father. I want to be proud of myself. So think of the, the reasons why you want that thing. Think of your uh, belief in the possibility of doing it because you've done other things in the past, similar, et cetera. And also if you don't do it, see if you can be more forgiving and not use any red flags. It sucks. You know, my wife will yell at me, but you know, it's fine. It happens, it's normal, you know? And, and so uh, go ahead and try to, to create or construct a motivational sentence on something that you normally do out of stress and see if you can replace the, uh, the red flags with this formula and then see how it feels to use that uh, formula. So I'm gonna be uh, quiet now for 30 seconds and I want you guys to try um, and create that sentence, say it, you can even say it out loud and then see how it feels when you hear yourself using that formulation. And to a question here, primary desire is not value. Primary desire is a thing that you wanna do behaviorally your values are the secondary desire. Okay, so go ahead and I'm gonna be quiet for 30 seconds. Okay, hopefully that was enough time to practice with uh, an example. 
And again, if not, I apologize, and I invite you again to review the recording later and to, to try it more in depth. And uh, we're going to move on. So we focused on one sort of positive uh, thinking, which is motivational thinking, in order to reduce the reliance on negative thinking styles. And then the other aspect of positive thinking is our self-esteem. Okay, self-esteem is what is behind all these disorders. Okay, so what does that mean? If I have high self-esteem, when something bad happens and my little four-year-old boy is yelling bloody murder, it's easy for me to say, yeah, that's natural, it happens. I know that it's okay and it'll pass with time and you know it'll suck for a while. If I don't have that negative, that positive self-esteem, it's a lot easier for me to say, hey, maybe that boy is right. Maybe that voice is right. Maybe there's something wrong and it'll keep happening my entire life. Oh my God, what am I gonna do? So self-esteem is kind of a counterbalance to, uh, to our, our tolerance or poor tolerance of the different manifestations of emotions. And these are more underlying beliefs about how okay I am in the different fields of my life. And basically these are just songs. I, I, I explained to the patients that this is basically a song that you heard in your head a couple of times, for example, why only 90 on your exam? Why not 100? And then the song playing in your head is 90 is not enough. And so there's a whole collection of songs that you've picked up along the way that are playing in your head each time a situation presses on one of those songs and the button. And we wanna identify those negative songs and see if there's any, any negative mistakes in there, anything that was just, you're singing out of bad habit and maybe you misheard the words or maybe you made negative conclusions. And so let's see if we can revisit those and make new conclusions based on what you know today. You know, maybe when you were eight year old, it made sense to think like that, but maybe today it's easier for you to say, you know what, I don't really agree with that conclusion. And so we want to open, identify these songs in various fields, open them up, reevaluate our conclusions, maybe uh, come to a new conclusion, create a new song, and then start singing that song and getting used to it instead. <clears throat> and we'll look at the beliefs today about themselves. We'll look at the situations in the past which they deduced those conclusions from, like a traumatic incident. And we'll revisit, uh, you know, very, very uh, microscopically, we'll revisit these incidents just to see what the, uh, what the uh, appraisals or conclusions were from that incident. <clears throat> and uh, uh, in the protocol, we break it up into eight fields, which you can see here on the screen. Uh, most of these are, are clear and evident. Uh, community just means everything outside my immediate circles, like what kind of neighbor I am, what kind of citizen I am, what kind of person I am in, in general. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world means my, my belief in my ability to deal with all the demands of the world. Go get a job, go uh, you know, provide for your kids, go deal with this lawsuit. Now there's COVID, go deal with that like anyone else. So it's my belief that I, I can like anyone else. Vis-a-vis -vis my emotions, you know, my belief that it's okay to have emotions, to have thoughts, to have feelings, to have these behaviors sometimes. Obviously that's always a problem one for our patients. Vis-a-vis -vis achievements, my confidence that I'll achieve in life enough happiness, love, success, uh, growth, all the things that I want. And again, these are <clears throat> detailed in the, in the protocol. And so what we wanna do is we want to um, help them identify the negative songs. And, I'll, and by the way, we can use the red flags again here because red flags are not dependent on content and help them. Uh, we go through the um, fields. What I do is I generally tend to ask them, give me a rating from one to five, how confident you feel that you're okay in this field, no matter what happens, you'll manage, you know, and, and you'll recuperate even if something happens. And five being the best and one being the most. And then after we've identified things that are less than five, then I ask them, okay, why not? You know, what's the claim? And then the claim is, uh, is something we've used previously in the, in the courtroom metaphor, which is detailed in the protocol. And then we check that claim, you know? So it's like a doubt about myself. There's a red flag here. And then we look at the, the basis for that claim. It's also from the courtroom metaphor. You know, sometimes it's just their way of thinking that justifies it. Sometimes it's a historical event that then in their mind proved that lesson. And then we start revisiting it again with very objective questions. 
you know, how much does this prove absolutely that you have a problem versus how much is this something that we know that actually happens to, to people sometimes. And as much as it hurts and it sucks, it doesn't unequivocally prove guilty that there's something wrong with you. Uh, and th there's a whole process here. And unfortunately, we're not going to have time uh, to get into that. Um, so that's something that um, you can see the description in the protocol or, or get from the uh, training course. Uh, but we're not going to be able to get into it too much today. Um, but basically what we're trying to do is uh, help them um, revisit these old core beliefs, uh, try to correct the negative lessons and, and, and appraisals, uh, come to more positive beliefs, and then we want to, uh, them to get used to these new songs. So obviously they need to remind themselves on a daily basis focus less on the negative thoughts as we did with the ruminations and the red flags and focus more on the positive thoughts, which increase self-esteem or motivational thoughts, which increase a sense of ability without being stressed out. So we try to teach the patient to be more proactive and aware about deciding where to focus their thoughts every day in order to create less stress, in order to create more uh, confidence and more um, motivation. Um, and then we wrap up the cognitive module with that, but we're constantly revisiting this, the tools. So if I see the patient all of a sudden in a, in a more advanced module using a red flag, then I'll, I have this, this uh, flag right here in my, uh, my uh, chair or, or sofa couch. And then whenever I hear them use a red flag, I start going like this. So re reflect to them that they just used a red flag in the room. And so we're constantly revisiting that tool throughout therapy or, or the uh, rules of timing. You know, if I notice they keep revisiting something, then I'll show them that they've just violated one of the rules of timing. Um, and I'm constantly working with them on self-esteem because that's something that can take months to really repair years of damage. So I teach them the tool, but then I'm constantly revisiting with them, making sure they're working on it, helping them when they get stuck. So we're constantly working on these tools, even as we progress to further modules. Um, in the emotion module, we're just focusing on negative and positive emotions. Negative emotions are emotions that hurt the self-esteem and create the behavioral, the symptomatic behaviors that we don't want. And what we, we want to do is um, we want to increase those, their tolerance for those emotions so that they're not criticizing the emotions, so that not expecting that they don't have emotions, so that they're not ruminating, why am I feeling like this? This shouldn't be happening. Uh, we want to increase the tolerance so that they're not uh, scared of those emotions and, and, and trying to avoid them and trying to control them and, and fight them. So we, we do this via the uh, uh, exposures and I, I think probably everybody here knows what uh, exposures are, at least in essence. And so we use exposures in order to increase their emotional tolerance. But again, our focus here is not just the symptom. The symptom is a result of an entire pipeline of poor habits. So we want to increase you know, their healthy habits, even before they reach the symptom. So we want to increase their healthy tolerance of emotions in day-to-day -day life, not just with the eating disorder or not just with the phobia or whatever it is. We want to increase in general their emotional tolerance for thoughts and physiological sensations and behavioral impulses. And so we do this with, you know, day-to-day -day situations. We create obviously a, a hierarchy. We start with the easy things. We work our way up. Um, and we try to increase their tolerance and confidence that, hey, wow, I can do this. And nothing bad is really happening. And it is subsiding on its own. And the thoughts really are nonsense. And then they start saying, okay, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe I can be the child that sleeps in the dark and let myself be afraid and stop fighting it. And then we work up the hierarchy to more uh, gradually more distressing things. They see that they can still do it. And then at the top of the hierarchy, usually we have the symptomatic behaviors, which are the most difficult you know, the compulsions, the uh, controlling behaviors. You know, with anorexics, I won't work with uh, exposures on the eating behavior until the very end, until they're very confident. Um, and so uh, we work our way up um, because when they don't know how to tolerate those emotions, then they'll, they'll uh, um, negatively appraise them and freak out about them and then have more anxiety and more panic. They'll try to control them with compulsions. They'll try to control them with eating. Um, They'll try to contain them. And then we have all those uh, BFRB behaviors like trichotillomania or tics. 
Um, so it's really crucial that we increase the tolerance. And we do this as part of a um, uh, uh, research, you know, where the hypothesis is, you know, something bad will happen if I don't control the emotion. And then the methodology is let's trigger an emotion, see what happens. And then the results usually are nothing happened and I was able to tolerate it. So um, when we talk about emotion, we're very specific what we're looking at. We're looking at tolerating negative thoughts. And then I practice this with the patients so that they can see if there's thoughts about the exposure, those thoughts as well, they're supposed to be tolerating and not listening to at the moment. Uh, physical sensations, behavioral impulses. Sometimes when I'm doing an exposure, they're trying to ask me questions in the middle of the exposure or decide something in the middle of the exposure. No, that's a behavioral impulse. We can get to that in a few minutes. Right now, let's just notice that impulse to ask me questions and the disturbances in functioning. Okay, and we have two types of exposure starts. We have a calm start, which is means, you know, they're calm at the beginning of the exposure, and then we do something to trigger that exposure. You know, and that's a very therapeutic exposure. And then as they get more advanced and more confident, we can start doing 10 start exposures, where they start doing exposures in situations where they're already stressed, but they're not necessarily in acceptance of that stress because they're so used to uh, fighting or avoiding. And so now I'll tell them, when you notice you're stressed, do something to increase your stress by five or 10%. Because the minute you do that, it automatically breaks your expectation that you're gonna calm down. Because you can't calm down if you've just done something to increase stress. And so by doing that, they might have initially, you can see the red line here, they might have initially been in low tolerance when that stressful thing happened. But then the minute they did something to exacerbate it, like if they're talking in front of a crowd, uh, you know, stutter on purpose, forget what you were saying on purpose. And now that increases the stress, but on the other hand, it puts them in acceptance mode because they stop expecting to calm down when they add emotion. <clears throat> we also have two different goals, uh, uh, functional goals, but the patients usually want when they come into therapy, they want to succeed in doing something. They want to succeed in speaking in front of an audience. Uh, that has limited therapeutic value because even if they succeed, it doesn't guarantee them that the next time they have to speak in front of an audience, Oy, oy, oy. maybe this is the time I will mess up and it's going to be a catastrophe. You're scared again. Uh, therapeutic goal, we want to fail. We don't want to succeed in order to see what's the catastrophe. Does it happen? Is it really that bad? Is it worth a stress response? Or did it justify more of a sadness response, but not a stress response? <clears throat> and the more they allow themselves to fail, the more they realize, well, yeah, it sucks, but you know, it was actually tolerable. And then they notice the stress comes back less and less and less from time to time. So we obviously want a therapeutic goal and we need to be aware when the patients are doing exposures, but trying to achieve a functional goal, which is less therapeutic. And again, I mentioned we do this within the framework of an exposure uh, to see what happens when we uh, allow ourselves to experience those emotions instead of expecting them to do something or fighting them. And then positive emotions, I'm gonna say this really briefly is just you know, they're so focused on the problems in their life and the stress that often they neglect to enjoy things or do things to create enjoyment. And then their whole self-esteem becomes this image of someone who's constantly struggling and fighting problems. And there's no self-esteem that's based on weight. What about successes and enjoyment? So we do these positive things. And the reason they're positive is because they increase self-esteem. Well, yeah, I have this thing, but I also had all these good things happen this week. And I'm also successful in, in, in my work, even if I'm having relationship problems. So we focus a lot undoing and appreciating. As part of our self-esteem process, we're always working on appreciating, even during therapy successes. And then, you know, we do things and we appreciate them throughout therapy uh, to stop focusing just on the negative. <clears throat> we might do mindfulness, relaxation, fun things, et cetera. On uh, the behavior, uh, a lot of times, by the time we've gotten this far, the symptoms disappeared or reduced uh, significantly. So sometimes this is just a token uh, work, but sometimes the behavior is still there. So the three things that we want to do in the behavioral module is we want to, first of all, uh, identify and tolerate the emotional impulses to do something which we've already done in exposures. So they already know how to do that. Um, if we have some BFRB behavior, like, uh, like uh, trichotillomania, pulling hairs or ticks or something else, we might do some HRT, which is habit reversal training to help them specifically with those behaviors. Uh, that's a separate protocol. So I'm not gonna get into that because we're almost out of time. 
Um, <clears throat> and if there's any other symptomatic behaviors, we want to gradually uh, challenge them with exposures. So eating behaviors, maybe we'll eat less at a time, take longer breaks, you know, fill up just the middle of the plate. If it's a compulsion, maybe we'll reverse the order of the compulsion, break it down, create bigger breaks. <clears throat> you know, trigger emotions on purpose in order to practice a separate behavior like, like uh, anger. Uh, you know, start a conversation that's gonna make you angry. As soon as you get angry, take it, go into the other room and now practice beating the pillow instead of responding to the person. So we'll work on those behavioral impulses if they're still left. And then on the other hand, we wanna increase behaviors that help us, you know, uh, uh, adaptively or just help us get rid of the, the tension, tension relief so that we don't have that buildup uh, resulting in BFRB symptoms like hair pulling and, and tics, et cetera. So here we'll do, uh, it will break it up into incidental and routine where incidental is where we focus specifically on when I am stressed in the moment, what can I do at that moment? We'll create a list. I have the patient go out and practice doing those things by instigating stressful incidents and then practicing going and doing something in that moment. And then we'll also focus on routine behaviors to create a lower baseline, starting your mornings with, with the relaxation exercises, taking breaks throughout the day, having a hobby, walking, talking to a friend, doing some more relaxation at night to reduce your stress baseline so that it's harder for you to reach that red zone um, because you're more relaxed throughout the day. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do in, in the, in the uh, behavior. Uh, it's really more of a cleanup section because again, a lot of the symptoms have significantly reduced. Um, so as you can see, there is only token uh, reference here to the actual symptoms of the behaviors. If they haven't disappeared, you know, we help them do a, a little bit more exposures on the behaviors, uh, break it down a little bit more. We do a little bit more of alternate behaviors instead and keep helping them. But the assumption here is the less negative thinking, the more positive thinking, the more emotional tolerance and habituation, the less pipeline gas there is gonna be ultimately for that sy symptom in the first place for that behavior. So it's gonna be a lot less powerful and present if at all by the time you reach that behavioral. Uh, and that's what I found with my, um, with my uh, uh, patients regardless of the uh, disorder. So, um, I'm leaving this up on screen, the review and follow-up, but we're out of time. Um, so I'm not going to be able to go into the review and follow-up. Uh, I did put for you a link in the uh, uh, chat box just now. Um, I see people are putting messages in the chat, so I'll put it in again so that you can uh, uh, see it. Um, and then if you want to receive the protocol, um, the PDF file, yeah, uh, there it is. So if you want to receive the, the protocol uh, or if you're interested in, in online training options in the protocol, uh, you can leave your email there. I'll send out the uh, protocol to you. And again, it has a lot more descriptive narratives that you can use, obviously translate to your language and a lot more uh, detailed descriptions. Um, so that's my presentation. I know it was uh, uh, brief and rushed and uh, we had a few exercises in there, which you're um, welcome to review in recordings. Um, I don't think we have time for questions. Uh, again, please don't put your email in the chat box, but rather use the link that I'm pasting for you and put your email there, because I'm not gonna be able to pull your emails out of the chat box. Uh, so again, uh, I'm putting the link in the chat right now. Uh, please use that to leave me your email address if you want to receive the, um, the protocol. Okay, so I know we have another session coming up in 15 minutes. I want you guys to have a break. Uh, so I hope you've uh, enjoyed the, uh, the session. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, I also have a Facebook group for questions on the protocol called CBT Time. Um, and so uh, I'd be glad to ask, answer your questions there. Uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>